on camp. The time is 1.40 p.m. May 19th, 2017. Uh, my name is Roger Soyset. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, with me is Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist at the History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we are here today to record the oral history of uh, Mr. Lounsbury, uh, William Rutledge Lounsbury. He served in the Army Air Force uh, during World War II and subsequently another 23 years in the Air Force. Uh, Mr. Lounsbury's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, we're honored to have you with us today and uh, thank you for your participation in the project. Uh, we probably should start this off uh, by you giving us your full name and uh, where you live. I'm honored to be here to begin with and uh, my name is William Rutledge Lounsbury and I live in uh, the Canterbury Court Senior Facility here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, where you were born and uh, tell us a little bit about your early years before the uh, entry into the armed forces. Okay. I was born in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio and uh, after about five years we moved to Dayton, Ohio and uh, I was there then all the way through high school and entered the service from Dayton. Um, At what point did you meet Francis Cole? Oh, all right, I met, uh, met Francis at the University of Cincinnati uh, after my uh, uh, release from active duty in February of 1946. And uh, we met about a year after that and then uh, dated through the rest of my college. And we married in July of 1950. All right, sir, let me take you back to the World War II, uh, what was your, how do I put this? You, you got a commission. Uh, were you an ROTC or how did you get your commission? Uh, no, I did not go through ROTC. I, uh, I had done some college work at the University of Dayton and uh, waiting for my draft age to come up. I was 17. And on Labor Day 1943, I was sworn into the uh, military, the Army Air Corps, at Fort Thomas, Kentucky. From, uh, you want me to go along with the, kind of go along with the history of the? Absolutely. Early, mili early sure. military? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, from Fort Thomas, we were shipped to uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri for basic training. And uh, that was, I believe, six weeks and uh, then I was, my first assignment after basic training was a college training detachment at Transylvania, Kentucky, Transylvania College in Leving, Leving, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it was supposed to be a five-week course. They 
saw my progress and looked at all the bits and pieces of college work I'd done uh, while I was waiting to be uh, drafted and formally sworn in and decided that uh, I could get out of there in three months. So early in January of 1944, I was sent to uh, the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center for uh, classification as to the type of uh, training I should take. Now you had elected, volunteered for the Air Army Air, right? Yes. Uh, what were the requirements uh, for that? Uh, are you uh, seen as particularly suitable for flying? Uh, I had taken physicals and uh, was physically qualified to fly in some capacity and uh, so then this the classification program uh, depending upon the score you got and nine was the highest strangely enough is anyway nine out of what <laughs> nine, well nine was the highest <laughs> I guess zero or one was the lowest. Uh, that uh, then they, the powers that be determined that okay, uh, nines could go to pilot training. Uh, eight was eligible to go to pilot training, uh, and so on. Had you ever flown I, before? Um, I had not flown an airplane, no. <laughs> uh, I scored eight in my classification, and I could have selected, well, I did select pilot training, and they said, well, that's nice, but we need navigators very bad, and we don't need pilots that bad anymore. So you're going to navigation training. Needs of the service. Uh, where was the navigation training? Okay, I, uh, let's see. As I said I was at the San Antonio Aviation Cadet mm -hmm. Center. <coughs> And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the pre-flight section of the training, so-called, was done there at uh, SAC, as they called it, and then, uh, then I went to uh, Gunnery school in the summer, during the summer, uh, that was down at Harlingen, Texas. And uh, from there I came back to Hondo, Texas for the navigation classes. And that was uh, probably November we finished. Uh, three or four months in navigation training, something in that that order, and we uh, the class I was in graduated and was uh, commissioned second lieutenants or flight officers. On November 11th, 1944. So I seem to be running on a uh, 
holiday schedule with Labor Day early on. <laughs> and uh, then the uh, after a 30 day leave, I guess it was, home, they sent me to, decided to send me to radar school and be a radar observer. When I get finished, I would be qualified for the B-29s. So was that the 19th bomb group? Yes. Uh, but that, that comes yeah. along a little later. Ah. Um, I uh, uh, oh, went to radar school at Victorville, California, and from early December to uh, probably early February. And then was assigned to, went to Lincoln, Nebraska for uh, assignment and was sent to the uh, training or checkout program at Pyote, Texas and the uh, the assignment was into the 19th Bomb Group, 93rd Bomb Squadron. Mm -hmm. uh, I was assigned to a crew headed by Aircraft Commander Bill McElroy, who was married with a child and uh, had been bouncing around during the war, pilot training pilots and various things. But he finally was given a crew, a crew and we, my arrival uh, filled out the crew and we started our training which lasted another couple of months I believe. Anyway, it ended up late April, early May. We, uh, oh, one of the things that uh, occurred during uh, as we began our time together, Bill was an ardent bridge player, and uh, there were five officers on the crew, and Bill said, Anybody play bridge? And nobody, everybody said, the rest of us said no. And he said, okay, I'm going to teach you. Uh, so four of, three of you are going to, three of the four that are here are going to learn how to play bridge. Who wants to play? Well, Harry Rugg, the navigator, said, I am not going to be taught how to play bridge. So that left the other three of us. I'd been exposed a little at home to my mom and dad and their bridge playing. And uh, the co-pilot and the bombardier allowed as to how they would <laughs> learn. So Bill spent his off time and our fair amount of our off time teaching the four of the three of us how to play bridge and make a decent foursome is something to do. I've got to ask, did you ever play for money? Uh, a little bit, but not, not much. Okay, well. 
we uh, continued with our training and there weren't any particular uh, pieces of excitement or whatever in the training time. Uh, and in late April, we were finished. And went to up into Kansas, I think Wichita, Kansas, or someplace like that, to pick up a new B-29, which we would then take overseas. Our assignment was to the 19th Bomb Group, 93rd Bomb Squadron, and uh, after we got familiar with the plane in a day or two, we headed for California and points west. We uh, stop off in Hawaii and your yeah. On your but way? before that, there was something that uh, Jane didn't get from me because I didn't think of it. Um, something about a sunburn? No, I, I'll I'll get that. I'm trying to think. <laughs> Trying to think of the base where we stopped. Uh, well, anyway, maybe it'll come later and it's not that important. But we uh, overnighted at this base in California, McClellan, I believe, and uh, the B-29 had uh, crew compartment forward of the wing and the crew compartment aft of the wing. So we put uh, two, two of the uh, airmen as guards in the plane overnight and when we came out the next morning, practically everybody was missing something. <laughs> and so despite the guards... Uh, Are we talking about personal property? Yeah, personal. Okay, okay, not yeah, I, parts of the plane. <laughs> no. I, uh, I had a, a, a camera that was gone. I don't know whether I lost anything else, but uh, that, all the pictures I took uh, in training and uh, flying across country over the mountains and all of those were gone. Other people, other members of the crew lost other items. So there wasn't much we could do about that. We cranked up and headed for Hawaii to uh, refuel and uh, before we headed on out into the Central Pacific. When we, by the time we got to Hawaii, Bill McElroy was sick with something, obviously, and they grounded him for three days. We were at our, on our own, do whatever we wanted. And I, oh, it was, my birthday was May 13th, and we were there at that time, during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, well, I think I'll spend my birthday at, at down at Waikiki Beach. So I got transportation and got down there. Uh, got out on a beach and made myself comfortable, curled up against the, seawall and various, and uh, obviously dozed off some. When I woke up, I was very badly sunburned. The uh, 
they didn't de delay our departure any because of my sunburn. And if you put a flight suit on over sunburned skin, it's it kind of scratchy. So there wasn't much I could do about it until I got in the plane and we got cranked up and ready to go. And then I just rolled the fly flight suit down so it wasn't messing up my shoulder and my chest, <laughs> causing me great pain and agony. We flew to Kwajalein, and I believe we refueled there, and then the next flight was on to Guam, which was where the 19th Bomb Group was stationed. Uh, we were at Northfield, and uh, there were other, there was, I don't remember now if there was another group with us at Northfield, but there was Northwest Field, and there was one or two B-29 groups over there at Northwest. Uh, other B-29s were uh, located at Tinian Island in the Marianas, and uh, uh, I know all the rest of this stuff. I can't yeah. think. It'll so, come. So Tinian had already been taken and promptly yeah. set up an air base there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they'd been in there in there pretty fairly good while. <clears throat> On the, so this was, I say, shortly after the thirteenth of May. Our first mission was. On the. Twenty ninth of May. And the round trip to Japan from Guam was roughly 1,500 miles. Or, yeah, 1,500 miles. And I better stop, take a breather here for a minute. Okay. Uh, just to get back on camera. All right. The uh, the round trip from Guam to targets in Japan and back to Guam was approximately three thousand miles. Uh, Iwo Jima was about 750 miles, about halfway to Japan from Guam. And after it had been captured and uh, all of the spring of 1945, because we have come into 1945 now. Um, one of the things that they set up there was a very good refueling capa capacity for uh, B-29s and anybody else <coughs> passing through that suddenly it was running low on fuel. And uh, a group, at least, or a wing, or whatever, of P-51 fighters set up for long range, so they could escort us to Japan or meet us over target areas and give us some fighter support over Japan, which didn't exist uh, until after Iwo Jima was captured and reorganized. 
did you have a lot of attempts by Japanese air to attack the bombers? We did have a fair amount of activity, but uh, that late, they were into June and July, and early August was the atomic bomb. That late in the uh, activity, there was they were getting less and less uh, fighter activity, fighter support, fighter attacks, and so we mainly had to worry about flak. And that wasn't uh, getting very good. I think the 51s were doing uh, some strafing when they were not uh, protecting us. Mm -hmm. We flew uh, 18 missions between the 29th of May and uh, the 14th of August, uh, the war was, the Japanese surrendered after the second atomic bomb was dropped on the 9th or 10th of uh, August. We did fly missions after the 10th. Uh, we flew at least one. And that was our last, our last one. Uh, well, one story that I have to ask you about is a bomb that uh, yeah. rolled. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We we did drop bombs other places than Japanese targets. Uh, one of them was a bomb that had uh, 500 pound high explosive that had hung up on uh, the hook. The, they're held by two hooks on the bomb rack. And one hook released and the other one didn't. So it stayed there for the seven or so hour ride back. And the, the uh, radio operator was responsible to look through a small porthole in the bomb bay door, if the forward bomb bay door or entry into the bomb bay. And uh, this thing was way back in the upper corner and it was almost impossible to see, and he didn't see it. So we flew through turbulence and this, that, and the other thing, and uh, all the way back to Guam, touched down on the uh, runway at Guam and felt a rather positive thump. And <laughs> One of those gunners sitting in a blister uh, on the side of the plane said, I think we ran over, I don't know his exact words, probably ran over a bomb, hit a bomb, dropped a bomb on the runway. There's a bomb rolling down the runway behind us, is basically what he was trying to imply. Obviously, uh, it didn't go off. And <laughs> It didn't go off because the uh, the fuses on most uh, most of them have been may have been different methods for different types of explosives, but the high explosive there was a little propeller on the nose and a little propeller in the back in the tail fins, and as the bomb fell. It, uh, those little propellers started to spin up and they turned the uh, 
mechanism in the fuse and after a certain period of time the bomb was armed and would go off when it hit a solid object. So that was the reason we didn't have an explosion and blow off our tail and <laughs> knock down the, the uh, control tower and a few things. A few other things. Folks at Guam appreciated that. Yeah. Um, so the it gets worse for the crew chief standpoint as we the uh, the uh, the bomb doors in the B twenty nine were controlled and actuated pneumatically. So. This door was, the pneumatic system was in, in, uh, in action, and the bomb hit the door, slammed it open, and then bang, the door was pulled back shut by the pneumatic system. So the crew chief, as we taxied in, saw this door that was split in half and as we pulled into the hard stand and stopped and shut down the engines he got a little upset because the front bomb bay door had been stitched with 50 caliber machine gun bullets from the lower forward turret on the B-29, not from some Jap fighter. So, I think, I think, and that was when he saw that, we had stopped in the hard stand, opened the, hard, opened the doors, and they stayed open. He was, I don't know whether he had uh, had already been assigned that the plane would fly the next day or what, but he was noticeably and understandably upset. He had to fix it, huh? Yeah, he had to, he had to change <laughs> doors. And it wasn't just un take out a bolt, take down the door, put up on a, no. Anyway. I don't know what details he had to go through, but it, not your problem. <laughs> it, uh, uh, so we continued to fly missions into uh, August. Saipan is the other. Marianas Island that was carrying our home to B-29s. I knew it had come to me. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody, I'm sure except the very highest people and very few people of them on Saipan and Guam probably knew about the atomic bomb and uh, the 509th bomb group. I certainly didn't. But on August probably 4th or so, we stopped flying missions for no particular reason. I didn't. And uh, they Paul Tibbetts, whom I met later, took the Enola Gay to Hiroshima on the 6th of August and dropped the first atomic bomb. And I guess it got the Japanese 
attention, but they still were <coughs> still were uh, active, didn't say anything. So we flew uh, I think we flew a mission between the 6th of August and then uh, the 9th or 10th whenever Nagasaki was dropped. And then we flew a mission on the 14th, 15th, the night of the 14th or 15th. And on the way home, uh, a, uh, a crew called into uh, the tower at Guam requesting permission to uh, make a low pass over the runway at Guam. And the tower responded, uh, permission granted, uh, good luck, the war is over. Mm. And that was, we were about an hour and a half on our return out. We, when we heard that, well, uh, one of our radios was on the, the uh, tower frequency. So uh, it was a pretty happy day when we got back and landed on Guam. After, after the war, uh, we uh, played a lot of baseball. Uh, went down to the the cliff to the ocean shore and uh, went swimming a fair amount. All this on Guam. On Guam, okay. we were just sitting around waiting for somebody to say something, and uh, finally, uh, in uh, late October, I'll say I don't know exactly, we got our orders to uh, come back to the states bringing a B-29 with part of our crew and the rest of the space available in it uh, filled with generally uh, mechanics and other enlisted personnel that uh, had, I guess, were probably would say high point people and they so they were getting them home, home as fast as they could. So you didn't have a lottery? No. A point system. I, I don't know whether they, <laughs> how they were telling but they said, okay, we're going to fly you home and in the B-29s that are being returned to the States. Mm -hmm. And that happened to be one, we happened to be one of the yeah. crews. I don't know what determined that. They didn't say, oh, you had 18 missions, so you get to go too. Maybe, and I, well, oh, we were, we had been technically transferred to another bomb group, our crew, along with others, and that whole bomb group was then going home. And uh, we made the usual trip, stops, Kwajalein, Hawaii. I didn't get sunburned again. That's good. By then, I probably had a pretty good one anyway. Because we did get a chance to 
well, I've, in that two or three months after the war ended, we had plenty of chance to sunbathe and so on. Mm -hmm. So we got um, to McClellan Air Force Base in uh, California, dropped off the airplane, everybody took their baggage and were taken to the railroad station on McClellan and headed for the East Coast. People getting dropped off at various places along the way. Uh, so had you been told you were leaving active duty? No, I was about to get to that. Okay. Uh, I was, I don't know whether they asked, where would you like to go or anything like that, but I was dropped off at uh, Indianapolis, uh, and I'll get to think of that fort's name or camp later, I guess. Anyway, I was in this uh, camp in Indianapolis being processed for one thing or another. One choice was you could stay in for six months and then uh, get out. I listened and said, mm, six months, that's enough time to do something in the military and then get out in time to start college. So to be processed for this program, you were sent back down to San Antonio. I went down there and they changed the rules. They took away that six months. You either got out now or you stayed in three years or whatever. So I said, well, I want to go to college. I got three or four years to finish up. So I'll take uh, out. You did have a GI Bill at this time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was processed out, sent back home by now. Uh, <clears throat> family was a little bit broken up, scattered around, and uh, but we got most of us settled in Cincinnati, and. Uh, I got ready to start school in the fall at the university. And I started in as a co-op student in aeronautical engineering. I uh, I had about had enough credits from the University of Dayton before the before I went on active duty and uh, to uh, make me good for about a beginning sophomore. But the uh, uh, cooperative, which is a work program type thing, engineering program, was five years. So I had four, 47, 48, 49. I had uh, four years of engineering work. My co-op working job was at uh, Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, and so 
so I was going back and forth. One of the one of the other co-op students uh, in my class was uh, a former high school classmate. He had a car, and he was going down to Cincinnati uh, every break that I took. So that gave me transportation. And we kept that up for about four years, as I say. But luckily, somewhere near the beginning of that time, I went to a sorority rush party, not to be rushed by the sorority, but to be shown off by one of my fraternity brothers and uh, met a very lovely young lady who was being rushed by the sorority. And uh, that was about the end of it. We started dating, kept on dating each other. And uh, after I got she graduated in 1949 and worked in the hospitals around around the university area of Cincinnati because she was a uh, she'd taken a medical co medical technician course and when I got finished we got serious about the wedding and on the 15th of July of 1950 we got married and moved up to Dayton and rattled around for a while. Finally, uh, got a uh, apartment in an area in an area called Dayton Victory Apartments. They had been built for the for the war. And uh, we're living there when, uh, and I, I had stayed in the reserves so that I was subject to recall. Actually, another, another, another little funny, our reserve unit, which was uh, flying, had uh, C-47s as our, uh, flying aircraft, uh, was on two weeks summer training and the middle of that two weeks was the Sunday that the North Koreans uh, got nasty and invaded South Korea. Mm. So of course we were very, very certain of our ability, training level, and everything else, and knew that as a unit we would be on our way to, to uh, South Korea very soon. Well, that was 1950, and in April of 1951, we were still twiddling our thumbs and scratching our noses and waiting to be recalled. At that time we started uh, being uh, recalled uh, individually on assignments. I was supposed to go to B-36 group down in Puerto Rico as a navigator, but uh, the engineering people back at Dayton put up a big enough fight to keep me that I went, was assigned back to the so-called aircraft laboratory at Wright Field. And uh, that's where my post-war activities started up at that time in late July of, well, yeah, late July of 1951. 
So I'd like to take a break here if we can. And I was All right, on camera. Uh, going back to the beginning while I was still in high school, I had been a, given a first alternate appointment to West Point by a congressman and uh, passed the various written tests and physical, first physical, in pretty good shape. So in the spring of 1943, uh, the principal appointee and a couple of uh, alternates, such as myself, went to uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, did a little more testing, had some more physical testing, and the, uh, the principal appointee was turned down, said, you can't go. I think it was physical. And so that left me the first alternate. And they looked at my physical and said, you've got fungus in your toenails. And we can't allow that at West Point. They probably take a lot of things now that they <laughs> didn't then. So my West Point opportunity went by the by the books. Yeah, and, their loss. <laughs> uh, so that uh, that's my pre-active duty, pre-war active duty item. Then back to 1951. The uh, item mentioned here has to do with the nuclear or atomic bombs, they called it back then. Testing, were you able to uh, be involved with any of that? I was, and uh, the way that came about, I after I'd been called back to active duty, and uh, in 1952, I was working as an aeronautical engineer, project engineer, in uh, the aircraft laboratory, as I said. And uh, the Strategic Air Command was looking for navigators and other crew members. And so I got, they got a foot in the door and I got orders saying to report to uh, Houston, Texas, and get re navigator, navigation refresher and get ready to go back into B-29s for uh, three years or so in SAC. And so we moved from Dayton to Houston, Texas, did my nav refresher. Uh, went to uh, San Antonio and was assigned to a crew. We went through uh, refresher training there as a crew and were assigned to Barksdale Air Force Base outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. A 
all of a sudden, uh, well, I've spent had a 90-day uh, tour, pre, uh, TDY tour in England as part of the forces that were fighting, in a sense, the Cold War against Russia. At least we were there to, to, to deter any heavy activity. Uh, my wife was pregnant by then, by the time I went over. She said, I'm not going back to Cincinnati to have my baby. And uh, I think I'll come over to England. So after we argued that out in a while, <laughs> we got her a who won the argument? Yeah. <laughs> You'll know in a minute. <laughs> we got her a birth on the, uh, going over, it was the Queen Elizabeth. And uh, my, uh, my, the base that we were stationed at in England was, uh, Rise Norton, and it was not too far from Oxford. So my wife came over, and uh, I was able to get down to the uh, port, pick her up, bring her back, and we stayed in a, a uh, residential hotel for a little while and then got settled in with a lovely lady who had a room to rent, spare. And uh, the, I had to uh, leave for the States, I guess probably in the middle middle of February, 90 days. Anyway, she was a little, the baby had come, a little girl, and not Jane that you all have met, but her <coughs> older sister. And so I was going to have to go back to Louisiana with the airplane and the unit, or the, those particular planes that were in that group. So we got her lined up with the transportation back on the French liner the Liberté, which would be about a month month or so later than I would be leaving. And we loaded up the airplane and took off and headed for the States. We got back and uh, after her month or so later, she arrived in New York. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where she came into. And uh, I got some time off, went up, brought her back to Louisiana. And uh, this was the Ring of 1953. We found a house to buy since it looked like we'd be there about three years at least. And bought the house, got settled down, 
uh, I guess we were settled. And it's the timing. Anyway, shortly thereafter, right field got their fingers back into my belt and started pulling me back to right field. And uh, you're coming now. You're not coming in a couple of months after you sell your house or anything like that. You are wanted. So urgent, huh? Yeah. Well, I came back and uh, my assignment within the aircraft lab had changed and I was now in the nuclear weapons testing activity where we had uh, aircraft, in this case the first one, that I got involved in. They'd been doing it in earlier tests. It was a B-36. It was already out on Anahuitoc. And uh, so real quick, I was on my way to Anahuitoc. Fran was in Louisiana making plans to get the house sold and get out of there by summer. It's a good place to be out of during the summer. Out of uh, Louisiana. Louisiana, yeah. <laughs> good. So that got us back to Dayton in the summer of 1954. And I was in the what we call the, call it the weapons effects test business, which was in the testing the effects of nuclear bombs on aircraft in flight. Um, That's another long story, and uh, I, I would like to now take my my break. And okay, if there's more time, then we'll do the back on camera. <coughs> Okay, back to the uh, business about Iwo Jima. As I said, it was a haven for the B-29s that were in trouble from damage or whatever over the target. and. Uh, was about halfway back to the Marianas, so if you could get that far, you could get in there and get refueled, repaired, whatever. Um, our crew went into Iwo Jima I think on about three missions. And uh, we were basically running low, didn't have enough fuel to get back to Guam, but for a couple different, not necessarily the same reason, on each uh, stop. One of them, uh, we'd had one of the, an engine beat up by some fighter fire. 
and uh, so on the three engines running, you got to run the other three more at more power, and that uses up more gas. And so that that causes us to be on the borderline to get for getting home. Uh, another time, well, I'm not not exactly sure, but. The other two times were both fuel shortage, uh, just engine problems, uh, not uh, related to enemy damage. A, um, it's interesting that the the damage we incurred. On the bomb bays, from the bomb that we dropped, uh, didn't drop on the target, but dropped on the runway at Guam. Uh, those damaged bomb bays, bomb bay doors, uh, didn't uh, cause us any trouble as far as gas goes. Anybody on bomb on Guam accuse you of trying to bomb them? I I don't I don't know whether there was any of that <laughs> going on or not, but the, I'm sure the crew chief accused us of something, <laughs> if not a lot of things. Bill, I've got just a general question for you. It's something okay. that's always kind of fascinated me about World War II history. Just thinking of the sheer amount of time that you've spent in that aircraft between Guam and Tokyo, that's a lot of flying in a aircraft of that vintage and sort of primitive, I guess, by today's standards. Do you recall any, what was that like? Was that, what was the hardest part about those really long haul flights? Well, first off, the, uh, the B-29 was not, it's primitive now, but it was not primitive then okay. because the cabin sections fore and aft could be pressurized okay. and uh, so you could fly at 20, 30,000 feet if you had to, uh, and the pressure in the cabin was as like you were flying at 10,000 feet. What or about on, the temperature? On the ground. Temperature could be controlled. Really? And uh, you sat there in your flying suit. Uh, over the target, you had to uh, turn off the air pressurization system and so you and if you were flying at 30,000 feet over a target area it was cold <laughs> and the uh, you had to wear your flight heavy flight clothes what's the reason for turning off the pressurization over uh, a target If if you were pressurized and flying along in your flight clothes, just normal flight suit, and you got a uh, hit in the cabin wall, uh, you lost pressurization, and there you were trying to get the bombing done and trying to get your oxygen mask back on and trying to get your winter clothes, your heavy clothes back on. And uh, so. Might mess up your concentration. Yes, a little bit. <laughs>
I'm sure there was plenty of excitement over the target. Did you get bored, though, sitting there for seven hours waiting to get from... Yeah, it was relatively boring. Um, we... Uh, I don't think... My, my crew station was in the back behind the wing and uh, where the gunners were. And the other three bridge players were up in the <laughs> forward cabin. <laughs> so uh, first things we first. didn't play bridge on <laughs> the missions, uh, coming or going. That's your story, huh? That's that's my story. <laughs> uh, stick with it. Okay. Okay, we kind of left off with the uh, nuclear testing. Oh yeah. Okay, we. I went back to right field, and uh, was assigned to. The, office that was working on the nuclear effects on aircraft in flight. And the test projects in the Pacific, we uh, usually had, and in, and in Nevada too, we usually had projects for uh, testing some models of aircraft. I say the B-36, I got my foot in the door. Um, my last project was a B-52, and let's see, in between, well, and I had a one had one test project at the Nevada Proving Grounds in Las, outside Las Vegas at the Indian Springs Air Force Base that uh, involved drone QF-80 aircraft and. The, the idea was to position three drones uh, at different distances from a nuclear device that was on the ground and uh, we were to synchronize our approach and passage with the timing of the detonation of that device. So that was pretty much my baby. We had four, four droned F-80s fighters from uh, Eglin Air Force Base, they had a drone activity down there. And uh, so they provided the drones that were going to be knocked out of the sky or not. We didn't know which. We trained, they, they trained for a while. Were these drones released from your plane or how no, did they get no, up? No, they, okay, the, the drone, <coughs> um, in our case, they were controlled by 
a T-33 with two people in it, one the pilot, one the drone operator, flying out at a safe distance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so the drones during the actual test were not manned. Um, anyway, the when we got around to taking off for the test test run, the first drone took off, started climbing out, and flew straight ahead into a mountain, which there are several of around Indian <laughs> Springs Air Force Base. <laughs> And that was the end of that. The, uh, That's why you need a we, pilot in those things. We, uh, we had three left, uh, the other two plus a spare, and they all got airborne okay and uh, on route to the blast area. Um, one of them, if I remember right, got destroyed, just got knocked out of the sky. By the nuclear by blast? The, by the bomb. Okay. Um, the other two, all of them had rather large canisters under their under their wings that uh, looked like fat bombs that were full of instrumentation now it would be very simple to do with miniature electronics then it was difficult So we recovered the canisters after the blast from those other two aircraft. Got a lot of good data. One of the aircraft crashed before or on landing back at Indian Springs. Gets a little hazy now. The other one made it back okay. We. Trying to think. I can't think of particular significant data other, other than that. Uh, if some, if you, if at some time you're flying too close to an atomic blast, you can get damaged or destroyed. And uh, so that that was news anyway to know. Uh, that was 1950, 55. Then when that was over, I was assigned to a uh, B-47, let's see, assigned to another, another aircraft test project in that category. It would have been out in uh, Operation at NOE talk in 1956. But somebody said, hey, he, he'd be a good man to 
do the B-52 project in 1958 to uh, lead that. I guess they said he'd be a good man, but anyway, that's what I... Were there a lot of volunteers for this, or was this well, not something people necessarily wanted to do? No, I don't know the, the well, the, the, uh, the test aircraft crews, they may have been, they were, they were not typically Eglin Air Force Base crews or others that uh, flew their aircraft as doing testing. The B-50, B-36, for instance, that was in Operation Castle was a SAC aircraft from the base in Fort Worth, Texas, I believe. And I don't know whether they said you, 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 and you, or what crew wants to go, or how that. Well, this did result in you being designated as an atomic veteran, is that right? What? Atomic veteran. Is that a designation that you got from this uh, experience? Uh, it, it's a designation that I might have gotten from it uh, for some, some reason or another, but it was in connection with the mm -hmm. atomic test that I've just been describing. Yeah. I didn't volunteer. I'm quite sure that the uh, aircraft crews didn't. Oh, one, as I said, one of the, the that the, the crews were not necessarily from uh, test crews that other bases or anything. The B-36 crew was a regular crew, and the, the uh, drone drivers flying along out alongside were that was their assignment at the, to the drone squadron down at Eglin, but the. B-52 that I then went as project engineer or project manager on was uh, made up of test engineer pilots who were stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the flying various and sundry test. Mr. Lounsbury, we are going to have to uh, pull the plug here today and we can pick it up again on a subsequent one, but our uh, camera's about running out of uh, whatever you call it, <laughs> running out of battery. Yeah. Uh, so we are most appreciative of what you've told us and uh, we will pick this up uh, with the B-52s. Okay. Sound good? Because you've got yep. a lot more story to tell, and we think we've only just scratched the surface. So no. we're going to do the second part It's next time. You've had a fascinating career. Well, we're pretty far along. Yeah, but you've got, you've got some interesting things that we want to have time to, to explore. So we will end our part one and pick up part two next time. Thank you. <coughs>